Hi everybody, it's Mr. Poller. In this video we'll be reviewing the learning targets from our DNA unit. The first learning target is to explain the Griffith, Avery, and Hershey Chase experiments and discuss how they lead to the discovery of DNA's role as the molecule of heredity. This means that genes are made of DNA. The first experiment is the Griffith experiment. This is the transformation of bacteria. It was pneumococcus, the bacteria that causes pneumonia that Griffith was working with. His experiments showed that non-disease causing pneumococcus could be transformed into the disease causing form. The question was what molecule caused this transformation to take place? Years later uh, Avery's team basically repeats Griffith's experiment. The addition is that they use enzymes to eliminate carbohydrates. They still see transformation. They use different enzymes to eliminate proteins. They still see transformation of bacterial cells. They do the same with RNA and still see transformation. Finally, when they use enzymes to destroy DNA molecules, the transformation can no longer occur. This really does show that genes are made of DNA, but many scientists of the day don't accept Avery's results as being valid. Finally, we have the Hershey and Chase experiment where they used viruses, uh, this is famously called the Blender experiment, to prove that genes are made of DNA. Our next learning target is to explain what Watson and Crick discovered about DNA. This is an image of James Watson and Francis Crick with their model of DNA. They discovered that DNA had the famous double helix structure, uh, so it looks like a rope ladder which is being twisted as it comes down. They applied Chargaff's rules to understand that the bases, adenine and thymine, always pair together and that cytosine and guanine always pair together. Finally, they talked about the sugar phosphate backbone running anti-parallel, and this is information that they got from the data from Rosalind Franklin. So this means that on one side of the DNA molecule, the strand is running pointing up. On the other strand, it points down. So this is the meaning of anti-parallel. It's parallel, but they point in opposite directions. Our next learning target is to understand the relationship of genes, DNA, and chromosomes. So a gene is just a small region of a DNA molecule, and a gene is going to be transcribed to produce RNA. So you can see on this DNA molecule in purple, I've circled one gene right here, a second gene right here, and a third gene right here. The DNA molecule, again, is the double-stranded, double-helix molecule that we see in purple here. We see the same uh, type of image right over here in green. Again, that's a DNA molecule. So now we want to relate DNA to chromosomes and uh, there's an important connection to make here. I'm circling a chromosome on the image on the left in orange. Chromosomes contain two different kinds of molecules. They do contain DNA. They also contain protein. And uh, so this is really important because initially scientists were trying to figure out what molecule controlled genetics. Was it protein? Was it DNA? This is because they could see that uh, the genes must be located in the chromosomes and because chromosomes were made of both DNA and protein, uh, they couldn't decide which it was. Uh, now when we look at uh, how a chromosome is put together, we have DNA which loops around proteins called histones and those DNA histone complexes will form coils and those coils will uh, all bunch up together and all together they make the chromosome and in our human cells we have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes in a normal human cell. Next we'll take a look at the structure of a nucleotide. Nucleotides are the building blocks which make up DNA. They contain a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. So I'm circling a nucleotide on the lower left corner of the screen. Again, nucleotides contain a sugar. I'll circle a few of the sugars on these nucleotides in pink. So you can see that the sugars uh, on each strand point in opposite directions. This is the anti-parallel. Now I will circle some phosphate groups in green. So you can see that the phosphate groups contain a central phosphorus bonded to four oxygen atoms. And then finally, 
DNA molecules contain a nitrogen containing base or a nitrogenous base. Uh, so we'll do this kind of in a salmon color. The different bases found in DNA molecules are guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. We always have adenine pairing with thymine, always have cytosine pairing with guanine. So let's again review those base pairing rules. This is really critical to remember this. So our rules are adenine always pairs with thymine, A with T. Guanine always pairs with cytosine, G with C. The adenine-thymine uh, connection, is, they are held together by two hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine are going to be paired by three hydrogen bonds. So the guanine-cytosine uh, rungs of the ladder are much stronger. A mnemonic to help you to remember this is having dinner at George Clooney's house. I had a form. Our next learning target is to explain the process of DNA replication, uh, to talk about the steps of this process and where it occurs. In eukaryotic cells, this is occurring in the nucleus because this is the, the location of the chromosomes. Uh, there are some important enzymes involved in the process. Helicase, which unwinds and unzips the DNA. I've circled that in yellow. DNA polymerase, we've, uh, I've highlighted that for you in pink. This is the enzyme that copies the DNA. The copying process is going to produce two strands which are identical, so they are the same as each other. And this is because of that complementary, uh, those base pairing rules. Adenines always pairing with thymines, guanines always pairing with cytosines. Finally, it's important to remember that this process is semi-conservative, so the two new strands that are produced contain half of the old strand, and then they have half of the strand which is newly synthesized DNA. Next learning target is to compare and contrast the structure of DNA with the structure of RNA. So RNA is a single-stranded molecule. You can see I've circled that on the left-hand uh, left side of the image on the right in yellow. DNA is a double-stranded molecule. I've circled that in pink. So single-strand RNA, double-strand DNA. Uh, RNA contains the sugar ribose. DNA contains the sugar deoxyribose. RNA contains the bases A, U, G, and C. DNA uh, contains the bases A, T, G, and C. So these are the main differences. RNA contains ribose, it is single-stranded, and it has the base uracil. Our next learning target is to explain the process of transcription and translation. Transcription means that we are building a new RNA molecule from a DNA template. So the DNA is pre-existing, it's an old molecule, it's used to make a new RNA molecule. This is happening inside of the nucleus. Once the RNA is produced, it is going to leave the nucleus, travel to the ribosome, where the information in the messenger RNA is read by the ribosome, and that information is used to put together a polypeptide, which is a chain of amino acids. This is going to become a protein. Uh, in order to remember the order of this, I always like to compare the two words, T-R-A-N-S, both words are the same up to this point. The next letter in transcription is a C. In translation, the next letter is an L. Alphabetically, C comes before L, so this can help you to remember that transcription is a process that occurs first, translation occurs later. Our next learning target is to explain RNA processing using the terms intron and exon. So originally we have a DNA molecule. This is going to be transcribed to produce RNA. Now, in that DNA gene, the transcribed portion of the DNA, there are regions that are called exons and regions that are called introns. Now an exon, this is, uh, I like to call it the exciting part of the DNA, is going to lead to messenger RNA, which is actually going to be used in the coding segment. So it's going to give information that puts in the amino acids into a protein. The intron sequences are going to be spliced out of the primary RNA transcript. So those are going to be cut out by something called a spliceosome. And then our next learning target is to understand how to use a codon chart in the process of translation. So let's look at an example of a codon, AUG. So how do we read this chart? Our first base is read here, A. We'll read the second one along the top, U. 
So that puts us in the third row, first column. G is at the very bottom of that. So AUG, this codon, tells the ribosome to insert the amino acid MET, or methionine, into a protein chain. This codon, GG, uh, will actually, no matter what the third base is, introduce the amino acid glycine into the amino acid chain that's going to become a protein. Finally, we should mention that there are what we call terminator or stop codons. UGA is an example of a stop codon. This is, when read by the ribosome, going to signal to the ribosome that it should stop putting together amino acids. Uh, so this is going to be the end of the amino acid chain. Our next learning target is to evaluate the risks and benefits of biotechnology. And this can involve social, economic, ecological, and ethical considerations. Biotechnology is using technology to alter the genetic makeup of a living organism. One example of biotechnology is genetically engineered insulin. Uh, before this, uh, people who were diabetic actually had to use insulin that was collected from cows or pigs during the slaughtering process. Now, the biotech version actually inserted the gene for human insulin into a bacteria, and this tricks the bacteria into making the human protein. So you can grow these bacteria, and then have them make a lot of insulin, and then purify the insulin, bottle it, and sell it to people. Uh, this is beneficial for diabetics because they're getting human insulin as opposed to cow or pig insulin. Uh, so there's a very positive social benefit from this. The economic impact of this was huge. It made the founders of Genentech, the company that uh, first produced biotech insulin, it made them all very, very wealthy people. Uh, another example of biotechnology is Bt corn. Now, Bt corn is uh, corn which contains a gene from a bacterium, and uh, this bacterium gene allows the corn to produce a toxin which is uh, deadly to an insect pest which would normally cause a lot of problems for the corn so now the corn has this toxin it kills the insect pest and the corn is uh, much stronger it's resistant to being damaged by pests um, so you would say that there's a benefit to the farmer here potentially there's a social benefit because the farmers would not need to use uh, as many herbicides or pesticides on their fields but uh, there is a potential negative ecological impact uh, that there are other insect species which are going to be negatively impacted by this corn which produces a toxin that is deadly to insects. Our next learning target is to list and explain some causes of mutations and we'll be discussing mutagens along the way. So a mutation is a change in the nucleotide sequence of a DNA molecule. So if we had ATGC that might turn into AG GC, and this would lead to potential changes in an RNA sequence which could change a protein. Mutagens are agents, either chemical or energy, which can cause a mutation to occur. For example, ultraviolet radiation would be an example of a mutagen. Now one possible uh, example of a mutation that can be caused by ultraviolet light is the formation of a thymine-thymine dimer. So the UV light actually makes the DNA molecule unzip for a short period of time. And if you have neighboring thymines, sometimes they can actually cross-link to each other as opposed to linking back to the adenine that they should pair with. When this molecule is later read by DNA polymerase trying to copy this molecule, the DNA polymerase runs across this thymine-thymine dimer. It's not quite sure what to make of it. And uh, so when it hits that spot of the DNA, it's very likely that the DNA polymerase is going to make errors in copying that DNA. Those errors are going to be conserved. They'll pa be passed on now every time that that DNA is replicated. If this is in a region of the DNA which is transcribed into RNA, we could potentially change the sequence of amino acids in a protein. This could be potentially a big problem for a skin cell, and it could lead to something like skin cancer developing. Our next learning target is to infer how a mutation may lead to a change in a protein that could be harmful, helpful, or neutral. So DNA molecules are used to produce RNA molecules. This is the process of transcription. 
the RNA molecule, the messenger RNA, is read by a ribosome to build a protein. This is the process of translation. So if we have a DNA sequence that changes, the RNA sequence, which is produced by transcription, is also going to change. Now, this can sometimes lead to no change in the protein, especially if it's the third base of a codon which is being changed because many amino acids have multiple codons that'll uh, give that same amino acid. So a RNA sequence change does not necessarily produce a change in the sequence of amino acids in a protein, but sometimes it will. Now, if you do change the sequence of amino acids in a protein, you're going to change the shape of that protein. And this can mean a number of different things. Sometimes you have a change which produces a non-functioning protein. Sometimes you have a change which produces a protein that's going to work differently or function in new ways um, from what the original protein did. And uh, sometimes you can wind up actually not even building a protein at all because of your mutation. Now, with any kind of mutation, uh, it is possible that the mutation could be good, it is possible that the mutation could be bad, and it's also possible that a mutation might be completely neutral if the sequence of amino acids in the protein which is built by that particular gene does not change. Our next learning target is to compare a body cell mutation to a sex cell mutation in terms of inheritance. So let's talk about body cells first. These are also called or also known as somatic cells. Some examples of somatic cells include muscle cells, skin cells, and blood cells. Now if we have a mutation in a somatic cell, it's only going to affect the individual who has that mutation in their cell. They would not pass this mutation on to their children. It's very different story in sex cells. These are also known as germline cells or germ cells. This not to be confused with bacteria or viruses that we call germs. Uh, this is a different meaning for the term germ here. So germline cells are sex cells. Examples in humans would be sperm or egg cells. If there's a mutation in a germline cell, this is a mutation that will be passed on to offspring and it's going to show up in all the cells of those offspring. All right, thanks for watching this review of the learning targets for our DNA unit. I hope the video was helpful. Bye, everybody.